Okay, welcome back to um, Mathematics of Data Models. This is Lecture 17. This is a Northeastern course called uh, CS2810. And um, we are going to, um, today, recognize the most commonly used distributions and essentially know their properties. So, this is Professor Wu. Let's get started. So in Lecture 6, I mean, previous lecture, uh, we basically looked at the concept of probability distribution. And what that is, is we are allowed to essentially uh, put, get a, have a function such that we put the event in and you give us the likelihood of the event. That's, that's what this function is. So um, after going through a bunch of exercises, such as dating, for example, um, I hope you realize that having this probability distribution really allows to give you information to make decisions. It's like it provides informative way to make decisions. So therefore, having this function is really, really important. And in the last class, I think we looked at different ways to get this function, p of x. And the easiest way is to just draw them out, which is called a histogram. We did the histogram last time, but histogram is a plot like looking like this or like this. The plot itself is useful, but it is still not a function. It's not a P of X such that we plug it in and, and we get a value out. So today we're going to identify, have a, learn how to essentially get this function, like mathematical function. And that's via the mean and the variance strategy. So what we do is we're gonna learn seven of the most commonly seen distributions, right? These are the ones that you will most likely see in like your research and studies. And if you recognize them, then by recognizing them, you are it essentially allows you to um, model it with the appropriate equation. So the very first one is called Bernoulli distribution. In a Bernoulli distribution, basically, it's a situation where you only have two potential outcomes. Yes or no, who's going to win the soccer match, team one or team two? Is it going to rain today? Yes or no? Will the student pass or fail? So in all these cases, it is just two possible outcomes. And each one has a probability. So the probability, if team one winning is 0 0.6, team one, then team two must be 0 0.4 because the whole probability has to add up to be one, to be 100%. So 60% is team one, then 40% must be team two. So when you recognize that you have a situation that's Bernoulli where you have just two outcomes, then you know from that, well, you don't know. But I'm telling you, Bernoulli equation follows this pattern. So x here is either 0 or 1, right? Because it's two outcomes. It's, it's either 0 or, or 1. So basically, um, once you have identified that the situation is binary, you can just use this equation where, let's say, like, x can only be 0 or 1. If we, um, if we, I think it makes more sense for me to give you an example. Yeah. Let's say we have a good date versus bad day. So good date, good date is, we're going to call it theta. That's the probability of having a good date. And let's say that's 0 0.7. So you have a good chance you have, it's going to be a good date. Therefore, bad date must be 1 minus theta, which is 0 0.3, okay? So good and bad has to be opposites of each other. And therefore, therefore, the equation over here really makes sense. P of x is equal to theta, theta, which is 0 0.7, 2x, and then 1 minus 0 0.7, 1 minus x. Okay, so let's let's take a second and study this. 
Well, it's either zero or one. So, and one means good date. And zero is bad. So let's see if they actually give you the probability. So P of X equals to one. The probability you have a good date is equal to 0 0.7, one. And one minus 0 0.7, one minus one. This results in 0 0.7 times one because one minus one, anything to the power of zero is, is one. So voila, over here, essentially the probability of a good date, as you know, is 0 0.7. And if you plug one, you would get 0 0.7. So conversely, what is the probability you have a bad date? Probability you have a bad date is probability of x equals to zero, right? Therefore you have 0 0.7, zero because I plug zero into x. And then one minus seven, one minus zero. This means this cancels out and all you have is 0 0.3. So this is the probability of a bad day as I previously told you, 0, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, right? So, uh, so the equation is not accidental. Like this equation is a, uh, is, is like, it makes sense that you either pick one or the other. So the very first situation you have, if you have situations with only two potential outcomes, and, and you can essentially count the probability. Like if you know the probability of good date, then you will put probability of one into this one, and one minus probability of the, um, the probability of success. So the way you can do this through data is, for example, let's say you went on 100 dates this year, this year, and 65 of them are good and 35 of them are bad. From this data, you can essentially say that 0 0.65 is equal to theta and 0 0.35 is equal to one minus theta. And from here, you plug this in here and there you have it. And so obtaining the mathematical equation is not, is not that hard. Okay, so when you have a Bernoulli distribution, you can also calculate the expected outcome. And we told you the expected equation it's just x times p of x. So you have two possible outcomes where you have zero or one, right, times p of x. And p of x, when it's zero, right, when you plug zero in, then you're gonna get zero here, zero here. And p of x, when you plug one in, you're gonna get one here, one here. The result is just theta. So therefore, if you know the average if you know the average value, so let's say you have, I don't know, like, like I told you, 100 um, dates, and you know the average successful rate, right, which, which will be theta. If you know the average successful rate, it will essentially um, allow you to identify theta and then plug it in here. So, so now you have two ways. You have two ways to identify theta, and then once you know theta, you know the p of x, right? If you have p of x, then great. So notice that the expectation is just theta. So, so let's say we have um, number of dates. So it will essentially add up all the ones, all the good dates. And good dates are one, bad, one. So when you add up all the good dates, that will be theta. So once you calculate theta, you plug it back into the equation. Okay. Now, Bernoulli is the easiest. After Bernoulli, we have a different distribution called categorical. It's not multinomial, it's multinomial. It's a categorical distribution and the only difference between categorical and Bernoulli 
is that you now have multiple outcomes, so greater than two. If you have two, the equation is pretty easy, but you have three, four, five, the equation becomes different. So situations such, like, such as what's the weather going to be like today? It's going to be rain, sunny, cloudy, snow. So it's not just binary anymore. Or which candidate is going to win the election? A, B, C. Or um, what would the number of an unfair die land on? So an example of a categorical distribution would be you survey 100 people about how they would react if their father dies. And 75 says that they would be extremely sad. 15 says they would be sad. And 10 says that they would not be sad. Therefore, this essentially gives you three categories. 75%, 15%, and 10%. Right? So how, in this case, when you have multiple categories, how do you mathematically model this situation? Well, the way you will model it is that P of X, the X here, is no longer just a single variable. X here, instead, is a vector. And the way it will work is that you will plug P of X will be X1, X2, X3. And only one of them will be one. So if the first case is, is it, then you have probability of one zero zero. So that's if the first situation occurred, that they would be, I believe, extremely sad. And then so one zero zero will be the first case, zero one zero will be the second case, zero zero one will be the third case. So you're gonna plug a vector in there. And the vector indicates which case happened. So let's say let's say we have this particular situation where the probabilities are 75 percent or 0 0.75, 0 0.15, so extreme or just regular sad or not sad. So these are the these are all the percentage 0 0.1. So what we do is we call this probability theta 1, we call this one theta 2, and we call this one theta 3. Once we have this, we just put we just put um, them into a pr into a product where we have theta one times uh, x one, theta two times x two, theta three x three, and that's probability of x. Now, if if um if the first event happened, then you're gonna write probability of one zero zero which is theta 1, 1, theta 2, 0, theta 3, 0. And these cancels out, and therefore, this essentially returns the probability of the first situation. All right, if you see this pattern, if I had used 0, 1, 0, then this would be 1, and the other ones would get canceled out. And the third one is... 0, 0, 1, right? 0, 0, 1. Then they will get 0, 0, 1. So they will get canceled out. So you're basically like have them have each one of the, the probabilities. And depending on what happened, you cancel everything else and only have one of them. So the, the, this is why the equation for categorical distribution is P of X and you just multiply all the probabilities together to the power of x1, x2. Now, um, we can compress this, right? If you have multiply multiple thetas together, we can just write the product. So it's going to multiply theta1, theta2, theta3 together. And that's how this equation came about. Well. So if we take um, what we learned for Bonoli, basically we just count the total number of occurrence divided by the total number of samples. So in going back to the previous, 100 is the total, and 75 out of 100 will be the probability. 
that's I, I essentially showed you how how to do this already all right the next one is called a uniform distribution a uniform distribution is a categorical distribution the only difference between uniform and categorical is that the uniform assumes the probability to be identical and the math drastically simplifies so instead of that previous equation we saw that looks like this the categorical distribution is just 1 over d where d is the number of categories so for example if you have a we are rolling a die right then the probabilities is 1 6 1 6 1 6 1 6 1 6 1 6 all right so so therefore p of x is just 1 6 essentially and the, equa the equation for this is as basically as easy as it gets. So that will be that will be the uniform distribution. Now, uniform distribution we can split them into two cases. One is a discrete distribution, and the other one is a continuous distribution. Okay? So, rolling a die is an example where you have a discrete because you have six possible outcomes like one, two, three, four, five, six. But in other cases, you can have uh, continuous data. So for example, where would, where would the MBTA train break down along you know, the green line? And therefore, that's continuous. It's not like it can only break down in intervals of meters. It can break down 5.75 meters, right? So therefore, if, if that's the case, uh, you can say it's like it's equally likely to break down in this case between A and B. Or I, another one would be what angle will a falling pin head towards, right? Out of 360 degrees, a pin falls, it's going to point some direction. So that's also a continuous distribution. Or if you look at your watch, when you, when you look at your watch, right, what is the probability of the second? Uh, it could be 1.1 seconds, so, it, so it's completely continuous. For those cases, the probability is also a constant, right? So over here, remember the area, the area under the curve, because it's a probability, has to equal to 1. Therefore, this, the width times the height, has to equal to 1. That's how you know the height here, and the p of x is 1 over b minus a. So it will be 1 over b minus a between a and b, but everywhere else will be 0. zero. So the probability the, um, distribution for uniform continuous is also really, really easy. So let's say you have the MBTA train, right? You can, you can, uh, they can break down between here, distance zero, starting point, all the way to the end, which is, I think, you have Oak, Oak Grove, Grove, all the way to Forest Hill, Forest Hill, right? And that, this whole distance is, I don't know, 50 miles, maybe 20 miles. 20 miles and then therefore the distribution here would be 1 over 20 miles right so p of x will be 1 over 20 in this case so not not that hard the next one we're going to learn is called poisson distribution a poisson distribution the the way to characterize it and you can remember is when you want to model situations that as x increases, right, the probability gets exponentially smaller. Okay, so what I mean is, you yeah, see, as the situation increases, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And you might be wondering, okay, in what situations would the probability get smaller and smaller very, very quickly as you increase x? Well, those are the cases that, that, um, are very often used in like manufacturing or lines. I'll give you an example. What is the probability that n number of chips will be defective? 
right? So if you're a um, semiconductor company and you want to measure the number of chips that would be defective out of a thousand, you can say, well, the probability you're going to get four is pretty high, but as what's the probability you're getting 15? Basically zero, very, very low. The probability you get 20, it's even lower. So it's situations where as the, 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 um, as you increase X, the lower the probability goes like very quickly. I'll give you one more example. Like describe the number of people waiting in line at a bank, right? So at a given time, chances are you may have one or two people waiting before you, but it's unlikely you're gonna have a thousand people waiting before you, right? So, so as you increase the number of X, again, the probability drops like drastically. Or number of sh death from a shark. Notice all these are discrete, right? Number of people, number of death, number of chips, right? So Poisson, is a discrete distribution that you can kind of get the get the sense that it's a Poisson distribution when the situation gets more and more rare as X increases. So you can say the number of sh deaths by shark is probably going to be one or two a year, but it's not going to be like ten. So it, it drops very quickly. And then as an example, if if you on average go on a four dates in a month what is the probability that you're gonna go for 20, right? So that's another one. If you on average go for four, then you going for 20 is probably gonna drop very, very quickly. So for those situations, this is the equation. This is called Poisson distribution. And as long as you know theta, you can now plug X in and get the probability back out, okay? So, the question now is, well, in that case, how do you find theta? Because if you don't know theta, you, you don't have P of X. So step one, recognize that this is a discrete situation where as you increase the number of X, the probability drops very quickly. And step two is you want to find theta. So how do you find theta? Well, again, if you take take the expectation. So you calculate the expectation again and going through a bunch of math. Don't worry about the math. The point is once you calculate the expectation, it turns out that the expectation is theta. Therefore, you just have to calculate the average. So if you know on average 10 people get bitten by shark, then you just plug that theta. You just plug that theta here. And once you plug it in, that's it. I mean, then, then you have the probability distribution. So, for example, let's say you go on four dates in a month. What is the probability you're going to go on 20, right? So if you go four dates, then we plug four into theta. Theta, theta, right? And now, now that you have the equation, we are going to plug 20 into x. So x, x, right? So we plug 20 here, 20 here. And it gives us the probability, which is basically zero. So if on average you go on four dates in a month, probability you go on 20 is like very, very, very low. Okay? So this is an example of a usage. Like, like you can, once you get P of x, then you can make calculations. So... The next one we're going to learn is exponential distribution. Exponential distribution is very, very similar to Poisson, as we just learned, except this is more for continuous distribution. Right? So for example, the amount of time a postal worker spent on a customer. Since time is not discrete, time is continuous, so you essentially would not use Poisson for this case. You would need to use exponential or the amount of time someone buys a concert ticket before the concert, right? The amount of time you take before the phone is dropped. So how, how long will it take? So the longer you wait, uh, the longer you own the phone, the more likely you're going to drop it. 
So, for example, let's say if on average people first drop their phone in 0 0.5 years, so half a year, that's the first time to drop their phone. What is the probability that they will never, never drop their phone within the two-year plan? Okay, so now if you work for a phone company, this could be a question they ask you to calculate. Like, and based on this, you can make some serious decisions on when to make releases of phones. So over here, right, if you know theta, right, then you know on average is half a year, then the probability that they never drop the phone in two years, then, then basically it, it's very low, right? So basically what we're asking is the probability that they will drop their phone after two years. So you can see this is very minuscule area. So in this case, if you know theta, right? If you know theta, then essentially, essentially, you can make these kind of calculation. So, if you see the pattern by now, we again calculate the expectation. Now, you might think if you calculate the expectation, theta is the expectation. However, exponential is the outlier. Instead of theta, it's one over theta. Therefore, if you want the theta, it's actually one over the expectation. So if you calculate the average time, right, and do the one divided by the average, you get the theta. And once you have the theta, you plug it back in. Now you have a mathematical equation. So if you want to calculate what's the probability they will drop a phone within half a year, you can take the equation and find the, the integral, the area under the curve. Or you want to calculate what is the probability they will drop between half a year to 1.5 year, right? So under this case, the probability that they would like, or uh, yeah, another question that the company might ask you would be, what, um, what is the um, expected time that 90% right, of the people will drop their phone, right? So you figure out maybe 90% so what is the what is the point of 90% area right if you figure that out you can then say well 90% of people would have dropped their phone around around maybe 1.6 years and that could be like a great timing for you to essentially um, make a new release right okay all right, the very last one we're gonna to learn today is called Gaussian distribution. So a Gaussian distribution looks like a bell curve. And this is probably the most used distribution. Now, this is used very often when there's like a center value and a uniform spread on both left and right. Notice how exponential is heavily um, weighted in the beginning. Poisson is also heavily weighted in the beginning and then drops out very quickly. Uniform is exactly the same, the, the entire. However, a Gaussian distribution, a Gaussian distribution is equally spread left and right. So Gaussian distribution, some people use it to essentially model the IQ of the population or the height or the birth weight or the um, salary I guess so um, I'll, an, as an example given the retirement age of an NBA basketball player right what is the appropriate probability distribution right so NBA basketball players I think retire around roughly 30 roughly 30 so most of them will be 30 very few of them will be beyond 30 Right, and very few of them will be earlier than 30. Okay, so the equation for Gaussian distribution, the equation for Gaussian distribution looks like this. So, this instead of previously we have one theta, there are actually two thetas here. You need to find theta one and theta two. So, 
for those of you that have taken stats, you will know that if you take the mean, the theta 1 turns out to be your uh, mean, and theta 2 turns out to be your standard deviation. Okay, so, if, like I told you, if you find the expectation or the mean, right, after a lot of calculation, that's theta 1. So if you just calculate the average value, right, you can plug that right here. And then you calculate the variance. And I think in the last class, we went over how to calculate the variance, right? You calculate variance, that is going to be, that's going to be theta 2 squared. So that's the variance. Okay. And once we know theta 1 and theta 2, we can just plug them in. And now we have the equation. Now we have the equation. So the strategy so far, I hope, is um, clear. There are seven distributions that we went through today, and what you need to know is to recognize, depending on the situation, which distribution is most reasonable. Right? Certain situations, it's like Bernoulli distribution. Like this is the example of a categorical distribution. So if you, if you recognize the situation is a categorical distribution, then you can just look up the categorical distribution equation and then plug in the thetas, right? Then you have the mathematical equivalent of the probability distribution, right? Or if you have another situation where it's a uniform distribution, right? So, so what you need to know is not necessary each equation, those equations you can look up, but you need to know that there are a lot. There, there are these distributions, like the seven we learned, that's able to describe a lot of common occurrences in life, right? And if you recognize those seven, and of course there's more, but if you recognize those seven, you know when to use them, right? What you do is you then find the equation for them, like this for example, so. You, s you say, uh, this one seems like a Poisson distribution. And then you plug in the theta by calculating the average. And when you have the theta through the average, then you will essentially have the mathematical equation. And with the mathematical equation, then you can do various analysis, like calculating the mean, calculating the probability be of events, specific events, even though that event may not be, may not be in your data. Right, so your data may not have that event, but you have a mathematical model to help you prevent the uh, predict the event. So, so that's 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 the goal. Um, the normal distribution. So we have we just went, did the Gaussian distribution. The normal distribution is very very similar to the Gaussian distribution. The only difference is that. No, Gaussian distribution is shifted and you have various variants. So this could be five, and a Gaussian distribution could look, can look like this. But a normal distribution is always sort of center around zero and with a standard deviation of one. And so th so th that's the difference. And most of the time, even if we have a Gaussian distribution, we like to shift it to normal distribution just because it's easier to deal with. So that's the difference between normal and Gaussian. All right, so let's do a practice question. Right, let's say you work at Google, and the average load time um, for search is T seconds. Your boss comes to you and say, hey, you're the machine learning specialist, mathematician. What is the probability that a user will experience T plus M seconds? Right, so you need to now impress your boss and tell him how you will solve this. So, in this case, um, I hope you recognize that it's a it's a time. We're talking about time, so it's a continuous continuous, and it's uh, more and more unlikely the longer the time is, and therefore this makes sense to be uh, exponential distribution. So over here is the exponential distribution. 
once you recognize that it's an exponential distribution, then to get theta, right, we went over the rule, theta is one over the expectation. So you, you, cal you take the expectation, which I think it tells you uh, the average, l average low time is t seconds. So we know the expectation, which is t. So we can just plug t here, right? So theta is one over t. Now, now that you know theta, you want to find the probability that you, they will wait longer than t plus m. So here's t plus m all the way to infinity. So you take the integral of this, and there you there you have it. You've done it. So in in this particular case, you essentially identified how to how to uh, calculate for Google um, the chance that a customer will wait like for a long time for the loading. Here's another question. Let's say you're trying to model how much time you spend texting. Okay? You found that you, on average, receive 10 texts an hour. Then what is the probability that you will miss eight texts for the next hour where you have your phone turned off? Okay? So uh, maybe you should pause the video, take a second, see if you can solve this. Okay, But the idea is this is texts so therefore texts are discrete and discrete situations um, where uh, a larger and larger and larger number is less and less likely is uh, called Poisson okay so so this is Poisson distribution and with the Poisson distribution right you can look up the equation here's the Poisson distribution once you have the Poisson distribution, you just need to figure out what theta is. Now, with Poisson, the theta is just the average, right? just expected amount. So you know that on average, you receive 10 texts an hour. So you can just plug 10 in here, right? 10 in here. And then what is the probability that you will miss eight texts? So what is the probability you're going to get eight texts? So you plug eight in here, right? You plug 10 into theta and then eight into x. And whatever you calculate, then that's your probability. So now you, you, you can, once you have p of x, once you have p of x, you can do all sorts of calculations. Like what's the probability you'll miss more than a? What's the probability you'll receive less than a? You know, all sorts of questions can be answered once you have p of x. Here's another one, right? What would be appropriate P of X for this chart? Well, you maybe you want to pause the video, but the idea is really simple. There are three situations. So three is more than two. So this is categories, like three categories, categorical. Right? With categorical is the product of theta I X I. So the, th the product, the three thetas would be theta 1, would be 0 0.5, x1, 0 0.25, x2, 0 0.25, x3. So there you go, p of x. So yeah, this is pretty easy to, to achieve. There we go. I did exactly what I just said. Now the concept of a cumulative distribution function. So you have... You have a PDF, P of X, which like you put in X and it kind of tells you the probability. Now CDF tells you the probability all the way before. So instead of giving you this value, it's going to give you the everything before. Okay. So with the CDF, with the CDF, it it's essentially a way of telling you like what is the area. What is the probability up to some point? So if you want to measure, for example, like here's the age, probability of age, and let's say you are 19, right? Therefore, the probability somebody's younger than you, you will have to take the integral. Instead of taking the integral, you could also just plug it into the CDF. So if you plug the CDF 
that's equivalent to taking the integral. So the idea of the CDF is essentially whatever that number is, right? So instead of P of X, we have F of X. Now you plug this in, you plug this in, it's going to give you this number. But if you plug it into CDF, it's going to give you the area here. So that's the difference between PDF and CDF. Okay, so now with the Gaussian distribution, by the way, if you have a, if you have a normal distribution, you can calculate uh, the particular point of the PDF. You can pick that point, and then it'll give you that value. Or you can pick the CDF. Right? So with NumPy, when you do the CDF, it then tells you the entire area. This is useful because very often you need to find the area between two intervals. So you will take CDF from here, subtract the CDF from here, and that will give you the interval in between. All right, so um, I, we just went over PDF and CDF. We went over histogram as well, histogram. And here is essentially the code that tells you how to draw a line. So when you receive the data, you draw the histogram, which looks like this. But once you use the data, you can get P of X. Now with P of X, it allows you to model the data. So you can draw the actual function itself. Right? Once you have P of X, you can draw the actual function. And once you draw the function and it looks like the data, it, it's essentially saying that you, you did a really good job finding P of X. Right? So you went from data to equation. And the equation, if you did a good job, should model the data very, very closely. Okay? So the code here, the code here essentially tells you guys how to do that. How do you take data and get P of X, draw it on top of it, and to confirm to yourself that you've done a really good job. All right, so we've done this exercise previously. Essentially, previously, all you had to do is to just load the data and look at the histogram. But this time, I want you to load the data and I want you to generate the probability distribution, the P of X. Once you generate P of X, this one is for uniform, this is a Gaussian. So once you generate P of X, I want you to draw the red line here. So if you did a good job, your P of X should be on top of this, like really, really, really close. All right, if you did a bad job, then you'll look like that. All right, if you did a good job, it's gonna look like this. All right, so, so see if you can take what we learned today and generate this P of X. And once you generate it, you can convince yourself that you did a good job by superimpose your function on top of the histogram. Okay, if you do that, then it looks good. Like if you generate something like this, all right, then you can, you can confidently tell your boss one day that like, yeah, this, this equation that I have models the data you've given me. So, so this is it. I will see you guys in the next